Hey, what's going on gamers? So it's yet another development blog video of my NES game that I'm still working on. So let's see what I've done since the last video. As usual, you can grab the latest ROMs with all these changes from the links in the description. This time I fixed a lot of bugs. The first one is really dumb. Somehow I missed the fact that the spear or a rock would keep flying after the checkpoint is loaded. Also, apparently there was a crash when starting a new game after completing the previous one. <laughs> Looks like someone was a bit lazy last time and did not notice that. Then I decided to fix a very old bug where a jumbo meat is dropped uh, when you stood very close to a bunny and shoot it with a slingshot. The game would register two hits, one from the projectile and one from the main character's hand. Since the reward routine checks the number of NPC hits, it would think that I damaged two different NPCs or might even kill them. Because of that it would spawn a special reward. I don't know what I was thinking when I wrote that code. Now I simply count the number of NPCs killed with a single player hit. And I use this number instead of regular hits. While fixing this issue I found several other bugs. Like this one, which was a bit more serious. Because of it the aggressive NPCs would get stuck in one place and would not move to the left. I've even noticed the same behavior with the boss. It seems it was happening because I somehow forgot to save a fraction of a fixed point number. Fortunately it's not an issue anymore. Also now the werewolves or dogmen if you want to call them that way now drop a reward if you kill more than one of them in a row with a spear. A long time ago they used to drop skins, but that was kinda useless because you had to go home and craft something from those skins. So I just removed that. Now they should drop rocks and berries. You can use rocks as ammo for the slingshot and berries could restore your HP. There was also an issue where the player is not notified when the inventory is full. So in this game all items are picked up automatically. Imagine walking on an item and it just doesn't get picked up. Or you try to unequip something but your inventory is full and simply nothing happens. You just can't do it. The player might think that it's a bug or something. So I decided to add a sound effect when the stuff like that happens. It was the least I could do. So when you hear that sound you need to check your inventory. Another quality of life improvement was to prevent the player from dying in their sleep. I know it might be a funny feature for the player to end the misery that way. But I noticed that games like The Forest doesn't let you to sleep when you're too hungry. Same thing is with Don't Starve. So am I the only one who is this brutal? I decided to show two menu dialogues, one when you're too hungry and another when you're out of the warmth points. But I ran into a slight problem. There was no more space in the bank one where I keep all my UI data and code. When I was making the game I was kinda wasteful and I didn't save uh, the space in that bank. There were even these chunks of data that were just filled with zeros and stuff like that. So I had to start being less reckless and start optimizing the data in this bank a little. I made that it would be possible to draw menu stuff with multiple iterations. Let's take these sleep messages as an example. I created a generic dialogue with an empty place for a word. And depending on the situation I would transfer a particular word data as a second drawing iteration. I also added an option to transfer a single data row multiple times. I could just have a single row with zeros and in places where I need to clear stuff I could repeat this row as long as I need it. In the end my optimizations were not enough because 
I was planning to expand my UI stuff and add more uh, letter items. So you know what? This bank also had the sprite update routines. So why not to move them to the bank 6? And by doing that, I finally managed to solve my space problem. Yeah! I kind of liked the taste of optimization. So I thought why I didn't tackle that issue last time where there was a lot of wasted space in the bank for the indoor maps. Yeah, it would be difficult if I try to do it perfectly and try to get rid of all the white space. But maybe I could break this problem into multiple steps so it would be easier for me. So the first step was to cut off four top rows from all maps. Because not only the indoor maps had this problem. The top four rows had to be empty because I would need to put my HUD on top. Since I'm not gonna bother to have vertical scrolling in my game, having shorter maps is not a big deal. So I should definitely remove those rows and that way I might save a lot of space in the ROM. Each of these four rows would be 32 bytes. So right now I'm basically throwing away 128 bytes for each screen. Those empty rows are actually visible with the NES screen tool. Surprisingly, I did not have to write a lot of code for my game to accept the cropped maps. Actually, I had to remove some. Of course, I did not uh, strip uh, the lines for every map manually. I created a Python script that would read the original maps and create cropped copies. I added the script to my make file so it would be executed every time I tried to compile my game. I figured I was already using the Python for the uh, FCUX um, debug uh, symbols, so why not to continue using it? Also it would be opportunity to learn the language, since technically I'm not that familiar with Python and I haven't used it much. I'm still keeping the old maps because they are perfect for editing with the screen tool. So this way by cropping the top rows of all maps I managed to save some space in the ROM. What about the second step? I think I could also crop uh, 7 bottom rows from each indoor map. The only problem here that the attribute data is also at the very end of the maps. So I have to be careful and not to remove it or mess it up. By removing these 7 rows from all the indoor maps, I managed to save about 1 kilobyte of space. Now the NES screen tool no longer shows the nonsensical number for the bank 3. I decided it would be enough of optimizations and I should do something fun instead. So the next thing I did might surprise you. I actually made that it would be possible to finish off the villagers. That's right, now when you attack them, your weapon no longer disappears. But you actually do damage to them and you can kill them. You might think it might be impossible to finish the game playing that way. But no. In fact, now if you reach the boss, it will suggest to you to off the villagers. Of course you can be a good guy and fight the boss, but I think the easiest way to beat the game now is to kill everyone from the very beginning. <laughs> Each villager will leave an item. The former hedgehog now known as Erika will drop the super hammer. Yeah, the hammer is back and there will be obstacles to break with it, but I haven't added them yet. Bjorn will drop the lamp. And the granny will drop, well, her own head. That's actually what the boss wants for you to bring him. Unfortunately, I haven't made a different variation of the ending cutscene yet. So now the ending is still the same, no matter how you finish the game. But I will definitely going to change it somehow. Another fun thing I did was a bit of research to see if I could automate my game testing with an AI. You know, playing your own game is only fun at the beginning, but it gets annoying pretty quickly. 
Also, you become a very good at it and play in a certain specific way that you think is the correct one. Because of that, you might miss a lot of bugs that the novice players or people that think differently than you might encounter. Since I don't have any resources to hire playtesters, I thought, why can't a computer algorithm play my game instead? I mean, if an AI is good enough these days to generate images and even videos, it most definitely could play video games, right? So I did a quick search on the possibility to play uh, NES games with an AI, and I found this old library called Jim Retro by OpenAI. I mean, it's not an NES old, but it's pretty out of date, and it's already abandoned by the OpenAI team. It was kinda hard to get it to run, because it requires an older version of Python. So this library should allow you to write some reinforced learning code to tackle those classic video games. It has built-in emulators of several systems, including the NES. You only need to provide the ROMs for the games you want to play, or you can describe the rules of your own game and add it to the game list. I was able to run only the brute force example with it. In this example, the AI would blindly press gamepad buttons and would try to achieve a highest score with every iteration. Sadly, I could not install additional OpenAI libraries to try out the more advanced algorithms that actually pay attention to the game visuals on the screen. Luckily, later I found a stable retro repository. It's basically a fork of Jim Retro. It's kind of the same thing, but more up to date. I could easily install OpenAI baseline libraries and I could even compile the tool that could be used to integrate your own game ROM. I tried to describe my game, but it was pretty hard to choose what things in my game should be rewards or penalties for the AI. I have no score to track, so I'm pretty sure the code in the examples could not do much in my game. But surprisingly, the brute force example was actually pretty useful to me. While running it, I saw that there's a very serious bug in my user interface. I haven't seen it before because, as I mentioned, I have my own way to play my game and playing that way everything is fine. I think next time, instead of using existing examples, I might try to write something of my own. It would be interesting if an AI could actually at least explore all the maps in the game. And that's all the stuff I wanted to share. I'm planning to do a next video near the end of this month, so subscribe my channel so you don't miss it. For the first time I'm going to do a shout out to my channel members. Yeah, I finally enabled the channel memberships. I don't really have an extra content there and I don't think I will make any. So I guess only if you're really into what I do and want to support my work then you definitely should become a member. And if not, it's also fine. I'm not planning to hide my future videos under a paywall. That would be stupid. Today's shout out goes to Retro Sorcus, who saw that I have memberships and joined right away. Thank you for your support, my man. So yeah, that's all. Thanks for watching till the end, and I will see you in the next one. Bye bye.